very happy to be having this conversation today. And for those of you who don't know him, John is the author of many excellent books um, that cover a wide range of, of topics. But I think it would be fair to say that your work is oriented around what we what we might call green anarchy or, or anarcho-primitivism. And maybe we can start by you just talking a little bit about what that position entails, what, what the fundamental tenets of the anti-civilization perspective that you're putting forward uh, is all about. Okay, I'll try, Victor. I appreciate <laughs> the uh, chance to talk with you. Well, you know, I think it comes down more and more, especially in the crisis of today, this seems to be an overarching crisis. And at, at the level of civilization, all the, all the previous ones have failed. And it strikes me that there's really only one civilization left, a global civilization. It's, it really, uh, that's the pattern. And I think it's a unitary thing. And uh, we've gotten to this place where I think the crises sort of meld together, that's all interrelated. And so the critique of civilization means, it seems to me, for one thing, to put it in a maybe pithy sort of way, that if if the future isn't somehow primitive, there won't be a future. Because, you know, things are just getting worse and worse in every sphere. You know, not only the pandemic, but of course the catastrophic environmental, you know, the physical environment that's going on, as well as social existence itself. It's just perhaps, well, especially in the U.S., let me say, I mean, that's where you have the most pathological developments, it strikes me. And there isn't enough uh, attention paid to the depth of the problem. You know, it's it really does, in my view, start with domestication slash civilization. The control ethos, always more control, deeper and wider and, you know, down to the molecular level. The domination of nature, you know, which has been, of course, upheld since at least the Enlightenment, uh, it's a necessary, wonderful deal. Well, it's it's just created disaster, you know, faster and faster. It's 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 worsening in so many ways. So I think we're maybe we're starting to see a little more dialogue at the depth that I think is necessary, which is civilizational, and it brings in. It certainly brings in the question of technology mm -hmm. and the values that adhere to that, the choices that are made. Not a neutral thing, it's not just a tool. You know, it's it's much more, has to do with the very fabric of things and the constitution of things. And that is not panning out either. You know, there are all these claims and promises, uh, for example, about technology. We're connected more and more, we're empowered and more variety and so forth. Well, those things are flatly false. We're, we're disempowered. Everything is getting more standardized. We're more isolated than ever. I mean, none of this stuff is, I mean, it's rather simple to, to see, you know, to you can compare it with reality. Oh, okay, all, all the ads, they must be valid, right? Well, they're not. It's just a big amount of lies. And uh, I think people, at least on some level, I know this. This is a visceral reality. It's, it's the way it is. It's not just my ideology or somebody else's ideology. It's just it's just a fact of life. And it's and you can see the direction it's going. Yeah. And, and in one of your discussions of, of the meaning of domestication, you say that domestication involves the deferral of pleasure and of understanding. And I think that this is, you know, when, when we're thinking about the implications of, of green anarchy for talking about medicine, the deferral of, of understanding uh, is, is, is abundantly clear. I mean, we, we now exist within a medical paradigm where the human being is ta taken to be separate from life. Not at all an expression of life, but separate from life. And we have a pharmaceutical drug culture who I think it's fair to call a kind of poison cartel or medical mafia. Um, that, that push a, a, a science, so-called science, that demands an unwavering faith in, in materialism. And in this, in this tradition, uh, nature is untrustworthy, is unreliable, is dangerous. Uh, and not only do you have to subscribe to that view, but you have to basically accept a kind of 
de-skilling of the human population when it comes to understanding what it means to live in harmony and thereby to maintain individual and communal health. Uh, so, you know, when we're talking about domestication as a means of removing the capacity for genuine understanding from a population, we see it very clearly in, in the realm of, of pharmaceutical medicine and the imposition of that domineering force. Oh, I think that's so well put. You know, that's what we're losing, the human touch. We're losing the we're losing immediacy. There was an original immediacy. Now everything is so mediated. And and certainly the the power of big pharma is certainly part of the impetus, which takes us away from actual healing. And of course, the condition we're in now is is really getting scary. It's it's so much chronic ill health or dis-ease. You know, that's that's another way. I, I wrote a recent piece about health and one, I mean, that's just one topic, but it's, it strikes me that it's a better way to describe reality or, or to grasp what's going on in the language of health, not so much politics or theory, but to get down to the real bedrock of it, to the basis. That's what, that's what tells you the body doesn't lie. And here, here we are, uh, we, and it is it, the estrangement that you refer to. That's so true, I think, too. It's, uh, you know, we, we're objects. There's a separation. We're not, it's not a living context anymore. It's, you know, it's the Cartesian separation where the, the body is, might as well be a car or something that you work on. Yeah. What, that's just bizarrely wrong. You know, that that is not the way to get to a healthy place. Yeah. Well, and, you know, as, as Descartes said, uh, his, his position was that the conquest of nature was to be achieved through measure and number. And now we have the same view when it comes to disease. Disease is something to be conquered, right, without, without questioning fundamentally why there is so much chronic disease emerging, why we're having epidemics and pandemics emerging as a result of growing ecological catastrophe and, and, and global instability. Uh, and you know, there's no there's no fundamental questioning of that. It's this it's this logic of domination. Oh, exactly. Yeah, the language that's used gives it away, and and you know, we're not supposed to stop and think about it or question the very terms. You know, the and we sort of all fall into that. I, I think you know, we the usage when you talk about. I mean, it becomes more the machine. You know, I'll, I'll scan that, or, or you know, there's all, all kinds of ways that it sneaks into uh, the way we communicate, and it's very nefarious. It, yeah, that exists on a very deep level. I'm, I think that's so true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so maybe we can talk a bit about this claim that you make in um, Twilight of the Machines, where you talk about how medicine can be envisioned as a kind of restoration of what belongs to nature, and and healing as an activity of, of removing whatever works against life's wonderful capacity to renew itself. And then you say the spirit of anarchy is similar. Remove what blocks our way and it's all there waiting for us. Well, I think that's, uh, yeah, that's certainly, I, I guess, a pretty good way to say it. I mean, if you, I remember a poster somewhere, uh, well, never mind, I'm, I'm kind of getting off the subject, but what is the, what is the answer to cancer, for example? It's no cancer. There isn't something you put in the place. It's you want the you want you want the bad condition to not be there. You know, so the answer is you know it's very clear. It's very it's it's obvious on that basic level, but that's not the way it works. You know, in, in modernity, that's not you you don't look at it that way. You try to make these adjustments and and not notice the the fundamental paradigm is is anything but healthy and and of course we're all held hostage to it all i mean that's from the get-go from the first walled cities you know don't go out there nature is dangerous and evil and you you need us it's a good thing you have us to protect you and i mean that's not the way it was for <laughs> For thousands upon thousands of generations, they lived with nature in communion with nature. Yeah. There wasn't a battle against uh, 
it wasn't that put in those terms, those sort of Hobbesian terms. That's that didn't describe uh, reality of hunter gatherer life or band society. You know, that's not that's not the way it was. The people were consciously working against hierarchy and against these forms of estrangement that that started slipping in. You know, rather uh, recently. You know, in the long longer span of time. Mm-hmm. I mean, that picture, that's part of it. I mean, you know, you it helps with the perspective if you notice that all this has only been going on for nine or 10,000 years. Whereas, you know, we were, uh, we had solutions to things. We were using fire almost 2 million years ago. And, you know, uh, in, a, in, a, in the way that people could take uh, responsibility for each other and be accountable in a face-to-face way. Mm-hmm. Uh, now that's that's just gone. I mean, mass society is has erased uh, community. It's just dissolved it, and so we have to rely on these experts. We're told we have to rely on all of them for these basic things. You call some specialist or or whatever it is, the cops or whatever, and that's uh, that's a very well to say the least. It's a it's a very bizarre uh, way to live, and, but it's just. You know, what's happened is the growth of civilization has just massified everything. Yeah, yeah. And we've reached the point with with this specialization. I mean, to to stay in the in the realm of medicine, I mean, you you there's so many medical specialists now, and they have become so divorced from an understanding of the body as as a living living totality that you know you go and see a specialist about uh, uh, chronic headaches and they will not consider at all a, any, any kind of underlying issue with the digestive system because for them it's unrelated. You're not dealing with the digestive system, you're dealing with the head. Therefore, why bother talking about digestion? Why, why bother talking about diet? And to, to, to someone who um, is not immersed in this kind of rigid specialization that, that destroys any kind of holistic understanding, it's obvious that the body is a, is a whole. That the body is is a is a whole and complete entity, and that all of the parts exist in a, in a kind of in, in ineradicable dynamic uh, relationship. But specialization removes that that uh, ecological understanding of the body and just throws it out the window. Exactly, the whole is just missed. It's it's not even uh, that isn't a direction that you you go in. You just yeah, as you say, this this part of it and this part of it, and more and more specialization and more and more technology. Now we've got robotics uh, doing surgery and and well, robotics taking care of old people, and you know, it's just really it gets more alienated all the time, and it starts with losing track of the whole. Mm-hmm. Where is the whole entity, the living self in the world with everything else? You know, it's. Oh, you, you don't look at it that way because you're too busy being confined into these narrow channels, and the, you know, and the and the elite, the priesthood has uh, sway in in the tiny fields, and and the rest of it is. Then you, I mean, I've had that experience myself uh, with an allergy. I, it was sent to different people, uh, and yeah, it was just, it was really a fruitless quest. They didn't, they didn't see. They they were. Yeah, anyway, I won't go into that, but it it was the whole lesson was born on me in on me again, you know, personally. Right. There was a skin specialist and a this specialist, and <laughs> I was having a miserable reaction to something. And anyway, the answer was really kind of obvious, and I should have thought of it uh, at the beginning as well, but I didn't. Anyway, that's we were all subject to that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And yeah, I mean, and the nature of the medicines that that we're taking too, uh, you know, there's a great there's a great quote by Richard Grossinger. He wrote a kind of history of medicine called Planet Medicine, and he says ancient herbal and animal medicines come from a psyche which is cosmic and collective, and includes the structure of botanical and animal forms in its meaning, even if these lie outside the more limited mind psyche of science. And you know, this is the the the, the scientific paradigm that we exist in now. Even if science is open to investigating herbs, it's a hyper-reductionistic picture where, oh, well, okay, this herb has had thousands of years of empirical use, 
but we have to dissect it. We have to find the so-called active ingredient that, that causes it to be effective. But of course, when you start doing that, when you start dissecting a plant and isolating individual constituents, you're making a drug. You're not working with a plant anymore. And mm -hmm. then, you know, then these scientists will give mega doses of the, the so-called constituent, the active ingredient that they found, and they'll get completely different effects than you'll get from giving the whole plant. And then they rule that the plant is dangerous. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's, it's just complete absurdity. I mean, how could, how could someone think that taking something apart and then taking one of those small parts, amplifying it to a million degrees and then giving that is, is the same thing as, as working with the whole plant. But, you know, the, the whole plant, the, 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 the chemistry of the whole plant is infinitely complex. We don't understand, uh, you know, all, how all of the parts of a plant relate because it's, 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 it's the genius of nature. Yeah, yeah, so true. I was thinking of the uh, identifying wild plants and somebody said, uh, talking about uh, pop culture and I can name all these movie stars and who they're dating and so forth, but I'm standing here and I couldn't tell you what these plants are uh -huh. standing out somewhere and which is more important to know about. <laughs> it was very effective uh, sort of anecdote, you know, that's it starts with things like that and they are embedded in a certain reality and we've been just taken out of it and you know consigned to these little specialized niches where well why would you who would who would care to to know things like that it doesn't have meaning in a completely estranged reality that's it doesn't fit anywhere what fits is to is to know about uh you know celebrities and their doings you know pretty crazy yeah and then you know what what does what does that knowledge how does that knowledge impact the quality of of attention and the quality of soul that we bring to the world right because when we work with plants we we learn to internalize the essential qualities of life i mean we we when we work with plants we understand birth we understand unfolding we understand growth and death trans transformation transmutation adaptation dynamism uh, unit of creative expression. And these are the qualities that, that are required to live in right relationship with each other and with the world. And, you know, where we place our attention, there things begin to develop. And if our attention is placed in, 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 in the realm of, of celebrity culture, then, w I mean, we're doomed, you know, because all, all we have as, as, as our guide is, is this realm of, of unlawful images, images that are stamped with, with their own falsity and untruth. Yeah, so many distractions and the fundamental things uh, are not only not addressed, but they're addressed even less as we go forward with all the uh, the way things are approached, the dominant paradigm. You know, it's, of course, there's more division of labor. It, it all starts, I think, originally with division of labor. You get more and more uh, effective power of specialists. And it just keeps going. It's that's the dynamic of domestication. You end up, well, you end up setting the stage for domestication when those gradients of, of authority or dependence get to a certain point, then then the dependency or the domestication can pretty much walk in the door. Yeah. And it's it's always driven forward. You know, a, a mainstream economist will tell you that about the economy. Economy itself, anywhere in the world. It's driven by division of labor fundamentally, yeah. and that's that's another, uh, <laughs> of course, insane part of the picture. Yeah, and you know we've reached the point now where where people are uh, so fixated on maintaining the the authority of the state and maintaining the power of the state. I was reading an article the other day by Andreas Malm, and I've never I've never read anything by him before, but. Um, the article is called "To Halt Climate Change, We Need an Ecological Leninism," and you know his basic his basic argument is that uh, the ecological crisis has reached such a point that the only solution is to basically introduce authoritarian government control because they are the only ones who are going to be able to in introduce the sanctions that are required to 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 you know to to bring back. Uh, to bring back the health of the natural world, and it's just like, how has a has how has authoritarian government control looked in the past? I mean, wh what makes you think it's going to be any different? Right, we have even less power. You have 
obviously less control over things the at the greater height authority uh resides you know that doesn't that's no solution yeah it, i mean it wasn't there's nothing that makes you think it would work as you say yeah so um yeah let's see here uh well, I mean, I think so part of part of this thinking when it comes to, you know, what we're talking about with medicine or what we're talking about even when it comes to ecology is that we have been taught that uh, subjective experience is unreliable, that the felt sense of immediate experience is unreliable, that we can't trust our senses, that we can't trust human intuition, and that there is something wrong with the inner life. Um, and you know this wasn't always this wasn't always the case, and, and perhaps we, we can talk a little bit about how how this um, how this came to be, how human beings landed in this position where our own experience is no longer something that that we are in tune with or that we think is reliable. We have to always uh, look outside of ourselves for, for for solutions. Outside meaning to those who know. Quote those who know. Yeah, that's that's certainly been. Uh a deep-seated drive in that direction away from uh, intimacy with nature, intimacy with ourselves. Uh, that's, that's really, uh, let's see. Well, yeah, the, the, the lack of, I think it, we're getting to the place where direct experience itself, it, sort of in the abstract, is, is going away rather rapidly, everything is mediated, everything is moved to the level of representation, mm -hmm. which didn't happen overnight, but it's, there's a trajectory that you don't experience anything directly at all. You know, I mean, that's, that's the picture that emerges. And then a further question is uh, experience of what, but experience itself. I mean, that's kind of staggering, but I think it's, you can't have the one if you don't, if everything is mediated, if, if everyone is staring at a screen and, and nothing else. And that, that's graphic. I mean, that's pretty clear. The, the dependency on a more and more attenuated uh, technological connection. Mm -hmm. You can just chart that. I mean, they go hand in hand. One corresponds with the other. And against the, the trust, the... Uh, the connection with ourselves, with our body, we're not, yeah, as you said, we're not, we're not to trust what the connection, which is really being lost, obviously, with uh, what we know about ourselves as a physical entity, as, as a reality in the world. I mean, this, that's not, uh, that's not there to, you know, it's, that's just, necessarily fades away well for centuries that's been going on the, uh, the the split involved in the more and more uh technological take on everything you don't you don't have that we we have we've become we had much more sensual acuity we know that obviously in terms of sight and hearing the tactile thing now they're trying to replace all that I read about these haptic developments in uh, artificial, well, robotic kind of stuff where now, apparently, and I haven't felt it nice to use the word itself, but I mean, you they can manufacture touch. Uh, <laughs> Think of that. I mean, that's just so, so wrong, so bizarre. Uh, you're not really touching something, but the machine can create that. So you think you're touching something. Well, this is virtual reality. You know, it's all, it's all a hideous piece. All of these things go off in these directions, which, you know, which is the same direction. They're just parts of the whole. The decisions are made by algorithms. The, the robotic, the robots become much more human. Sex dolls become more human-like. I mean, it's just, it's really, uh, it's so awful, of course. I mean, and, and it, you're just taken along for the ride. Oh, I see. That's what they're doing now. Oh, huh? well, maybe there could be some bad effects. But hey, this is the whole movement of things. It really is. It's not the transhumanists, you know, the people that really worship technology. We can live forever. 
all these uh, very unhealthy fantasies, uh, they're so remote from life. There's, they seem to be so terrified of death for one thing. I mean, that's not the whole picture, but you know, that's that's the logic of this whole thing. It can it sounds especially loony uh, and fringe, but that's that's the way it's going. It's that's not separate from the rest of it, from the main thrust of the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, well put, and you know, it brings to mind the the claim that you make that. To assert that we can be whole, enlightened, healed within the present madness amounts to endorsing the madness. And I think that we have, I mean, this this claim, I, I think, is is uh, really very thought provoking for me for a number of different reasons. I mean, um, for one thing, it, it, it speaks to just how far we have come to actually being in a position of genuine health both on a collective level and on an individual level. I mean, most people don't know what it actually feels like to be genuinely healthy. Uh, you know, the totality that we exist in strives on uh, the eradication of the well-being of, of the individual person and the perpetuation of this kind of global immiseration that, by definition, uh, makes, makes the individual, the, the health of the individual, something, something out of reach. And, you know, uh, it, it's kind of this, this aporia when it comes to, to working in, in a health profession because there are so many things that, um, you know, really we can do as practitioners, but unless there is a kind of uh, confrontation of, of the systemic conditions that are going on, so many conditions are not, you know, the root cause isn't going to be addressed. Yeah, yeah. As a healer, you, you see this very, very clearly. You focused on that, uh, obviously. And all of these different parts. I mean, now, you know, one of the key buzzwords lately, and I hate to reduce it to a buzzword, but loneliness. Mm -hmm. People are so adrift. They're so uprooted. And that's where you get the, the mass shootings. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so much anxiety, depression, and you know more about this than I do, but it's it has to be connected with the, well, it's even false to separate the two, but from the physiological problems to the emotional or mental problems, it's the same thing. Yeah. And and now it's it's really hard, I think, to not notice that. I mean, that's, you might say that's the silver lining. It's gotten so bad that it's very, very hard to deny, you know, so maybe that's, maybe that's our uh, leverage or maybe that's our chance to, you know, enlarge the discussion of these things. These people are in horrible shape. They just are, and no matter what uh, affliction it is, and they're more and more chronic ones and longevity goes down, suicide rates go up, opioid epidemic, all these things, are just uh, these various painful pathologies of late civilization. It's getting worse and worse. It's not, where where do you look for the healthy part of the future? We yeah. don't like to see some better days, you know, but there's no grounds for that as long as we're still stuck with this whole dynamic, this whole paradigm. It's, it's only going to get worse. And, you know, Alice and I, we think about our grandkids and, and what kind of world they're going to have in just, you know, maybe just a scant few years, not even, not looking at the rest of the century necessarily, but just, you know, at hand, here it is at hand. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and, you know, as, as you say, um, you know, we, we have these, these chronic uh, afflictions that are emerging, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, that are debilitating many people and no specific causes can be found. You say it is as if a growing number of people are simply becoming allergic to society itself. Yeah, it's, uh, the whole thing is is uh, just fundamentally uh, off. That's just I think that is getting hard to harder to miss. But I mean, you know, that's I mean, who knows? It's you can't guarantee that anything is going to shift. I mean, maybe people just take more drugs, illegal and legal and so forth, and stumble through life uh, not seeing anything else. Obviously. We don't have a great access. I think it's changing slightly, but you know, to get to try to change the dialogue, to try to change the discourse, so much opposes that. 
yeah, clearly. Yeah. You know, it's not, oh, yeah, why don't you come on and talk about this? I mean, uh, no, we got everything arrayed against it. Not everything, but, and again, I'd say that it's so, it's on such shaky grounds that uh, I think there'll be more openings and maybe already are. Do you think there's a little bit more awareness or uh, I, at least I, curiosity? Yeah, I, I, I think I think that the, the tides are, are starting to change a little bit. And I, you know, I see people that even a couple of years ago would have no interest in herbal medicine or homeopathy, starting to think about these things in different ways. Um, in part because, you know, uh, people are going into the hospital system now, for example, for what used to be a routine procedure. And then when they're there, they pick up an antibiotic, antibiotic resistant bug and an infection so severe that that their life is, is in danger. And, you know, the, uh, Alexander Fleming, the inventor of penicillin, when he won the Nobel Prize, he said at the end of the speech, uh, he said penicillin is very powerful and the bacteria are very intelligent. What happens if we misuse penicillin is that resistance will become something that we're going to have to grapple with. And no one listened to him. Wow. And, now, and now, now we have uh, this huge, huge, huge problem with antibiotic resistant bacteria. And you know, many of the people who are in the hospital now with COVID are in fact dying of antibiotic resistant bugs that they're picking up in the hospital system. Right, I so, see. If, if that happens to someone then and they and they manage to survive it, then probably they're going to start thinking differently about the allopathic uh, uh, system, you know. And, I, and Illich talked about that, didn't he? That what is uh, is that? I had, what is the word uh, starts with an I? But we're we're so dependent on drug technology. That's that's a massive fact of life. And what does it get? It, it's as he said. There's going to be there'll be. And now we're already there. I mean, the the, the amount of uh, bacteria that's completely impervious to these drugs. It, it, they just uh, they were announcing this. I was seeing they were, this was being predicted a few years ago. Now it's it's pretty much a fact, isn't it? That yeah, that's the absolutely. absolutely, yeah. And you know, and what is what is the philosophy of of antibiotics? You know, the, the philosophy of antibiotics is basically to suppress and disguise disease. To suppress and disguise the disease process, and basically, when when we use antibiotics, we avoid taking responsibility for the disease as it as it is manifest here and now. And it's basically, you know, the disease is pushed deeper and deeper and deeper down into the system. It causes deeper damages to the to the body, especially to the immune system, and then long term can contribute to the breakdown of of the immune system, and. You know, people people don't think to connect, you know, one disease that's suppressed by means of antibiotics and a disease that emerges 10 years later, which is more virulent than the disease that first appeared. But it's the same disease. It's the same disease, but was just masked by the antibiotics. That's all it's doing. Wow. And and this whole this whole uh, uh, philosophy of, of the allopathic medicine is to uh, endlessly postpone uh, the treatment of a disease and not to cure cure is, is a very radical word you know cure is something that the allopathic doctors don't want to do they want to keep people on drugs indefinitely uh, so you know people are starting to wake up to that and and think well you know i don't want to be taking these drugs my whole life and people are starting to tune into the fact that oh well i started taking these drugs and actually i don't feel so well while, while i'm on them you know my doctor says i'm gonna have to be on them for the rest of my life but i don't want to be taking them forever so, you know, there's more and more of this kind of thinking starting to emerge, which I think is a really good thing. Yeah, I think that's, it's it strikes me that there's more awareness and the same with uh, psychotropic drugs. You can just blotto somebody while well, they, maybe they're not suicide because, suicidal, but, or maybe they are because they have no emotional life left. They have no human span of feelings. Mm -hmm. you, you've tried to eradicate that, you suppress it with these, with these massive drugs, that's yeah. what that's the answer for that. Yeah. It's handed out all the time, and then you know it's it's unbearable. Yeah, and and there's no effort on the part of those psychiatrists or or allopathic physicians to try and perceive the wrongs of life, you know, and which is which is the fundamental pathology that people are suffering from is the wrongs of life, and you know, in in the homeopathic philosophy, Samuel Hahnemann talks about the vital force, and he says. You know, the material organism without the vital force 
is capable of no sensation, no function, no self-preservation. It derives all sensation and performs all the functions of life solely by means of the immaterial being, the vital principle, which animates the material organism in health and disease. And we have a medical paradigm now that just refuses to accept anything like the vital force existing at all. Right. Oh. And, and, and there's no way to, to gauge how the vital force is functioning in the body because it doesn't exist, you know, right, and right. rather what, what we point to in the case of psychiatric uh, uh, conditions is chemical imbalances, so-called chemical imbalances. Right. And this this level of, of de depth perception on, on thinking about how the individual is actually interfacing with the world. That's just thrown out the window. There's no consideration of that at all. And the failure of these things, you know, sooner or later, you find out they don't work. I mean, that doesn't deter them, but I mean, uh, one can think of various examples. The uh, anyway, that's yeah, that it, it doesn't make them change course or rethink their approach. They're trained that way. I mean, well, everywhere, not just medical school, but before that, what are the paradigms they have to swallow? You know, what are the what's the dominant uh, deal? Yeah. And, you know, if we're, we're, we talk about these these psychotropic drugs, you know, S SRIs, SSRIs, you know, right. this is this is it. We have a similar problem to the to the proliferation of antibiotic resistant bacteria with SRIs, because we, we've reached the point where these these SRIs and SSRI drugs uh, can be found in in water systems throughout the world. You know, and right. there's, there's trace amounts of these drugs now and basically the drinking water of most people around the world. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and you know, this, these, these drugs, uh, these, these uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors uh, affect essentially every organism that uses serotonin in, in their functioning. So basically we're talking about everything. And now the whole, the whole global ecology is being affected as a result of, the, you know, this massive dumping uh, of SRIs and SSRI drugs into the, into the water system. And the waste system and you know it's just it's a massive massive crisis and so yeah we, you know talking about it in terms of you know the, these drugs large being largely ineffective as study after study is showing but yeah. now causing and adding to the great uh ecological immiseration of of uh you know of, of the 21st century and i was amazed to find that i started seeing uh, that kind of evidence oh 10 or 20 years ago and and I was kind of staggered. I thought, how could that be detectable? It must be so minute. That, that's, boy, that's worse than I thought. The, the ways we're being poisoned, that's just one more way. But wow, that shows the, the level of uh, how people are being drugged. And yeah, and then they come around later, uh, by the way, th that doesn't work. <laughs> the... the SRI stuff, that's, it just, it really hasn't worked, but we're not making a big deal about that. So much trumpeted about that. Well, now we know how it works. It's just going to be great. And, mm, you know, yeah. even by their methods, they've had to concede that, uh, no, that was a failure. Well, well, exactly. And, and we know now too, that, that SRIs and SSRIs, once they, once they're in streams, and reduced to sediment at the bot at the bottom of bodies of water. They show no signs of biodegrading. No, really? yeah, no signs at all. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so oh. it's it, it's it's a, it's a bigger problem than than we're, we're even made 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 to think because these things don't biodegrade. You know, per yeah. permanently altering the the ecological matrix of the planet. Wow. <clears throat> yeah. And yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, it, we can give so many examples, you know, so many examples. But I thought, you know, we can maybe talk since, since we're dealing with, with a, a virus right now, you know, uh, I, I think it's interesting to talk about uh, the rigidness of, of scientific picture thinking uh, when it comes to thinking about the nature of, of viral organisms as an example, right? And so you hear this over and over again, scientists will say, well, viruses aren't alive. And, you know, they give, they give their, their rationale for this. They say that they're organisms, virus, viruses are organisms at the edge of life, but that they're not organisms in any meaningful sense of the word. And they say, well, this is because viruses lack a cellular structure. They don't use cellular division. Uh, 
they don't have their own metabolism. They don't reproduce inside cellular structures. They give all these, these, uh, these uh, reasons for why they don't consider viruses to be alive. But then when you ask them, you say, well, this definition of life that you're operating with, where does it come from? And if you push them on it, they have to admit that it's an invention. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and this is, you know, this is one example, but there's so many examples of this, of this, you know, going back to this notion of specialization, where we're dealing now with a society of, of people who just latch onto inherited ideologies. And, you know, they, they it just, it becomes so dogmatic, so mm -hmm. dogmatic that they, they don't want to, they don't want to give them up. And there's not even like even trying to convince them of, of being open to discussion it gets dismissed. The very invitation to discuss gets dismissed. And, you know, this is this is an example of what Wilhelm Reich called the symptom of the emotional plague. You know, the, the, he says the plague individual is not open to discussion. The plague individual wants to in, enforce his or her position and doesn't want to hear anything that goes against their own ideology. Whereas the, you know, the healthy individual is more than happy to talk because it expands the possibilities for thinking and for living. Yeah, right. The character armor, the, the ways that uh, it's not a simple rational thing. This is at a deep uh, personality structure as it's, as, it's, uh, as it's been developed. Mm -hmm. You know, and people, yeah, part of that same frustration, I think of, uh, well, I have a, an archaeology friend, and she always says, in terms of anarcho-primitivism or green anarchy, she's and she's working in the field, you know, not that I'm not, but uh, they, they these people know everything we do, you know. In other words, this is not invented by some anarchists. This is the way people lived mm -hmm. before there was infectious disease or degenerative disease when people lived in community face-to-face, -face, all that stuff, with the obvious radical implications, but how few of them see, there it is. I mean, to me, that was just, it blew my mind in the 80s because I wasn't thinking in terms of anthropology or prehistory at all. Right. I was working on other stuff and I just stumbled into it. Just at the university library, I started seeing this stuff and the whole thing opened up. Anyway, uh, that's that, that can be maddening too, that people you would say they know better, but they're close to see, well, for example, in this case, you know, well, if people live that way for so long, uh, that's a possibility we could live that way in some way, not, not an exact model or replica, but, you know, that's, that isn't just theory. That's, uh, I mean, that's 99% of the species existence as, as homo species. So, but they, they're not, uh, they're not rushing to, uh, to take that on, to, to share that in a way that would, would uh, move things in a healthier direction. I mean, right. some are, I mean, I know people in the field that are, but, but you would think there'd be a lot more than there are, you know, on a rational level. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so maybe, maybe we can talk a little bit about your your critique of of psychoanalysis and, and of and of psychiatry, um, and you know I think that that this is one of the areas um, that is somewhat outside of the dominant paradigm, at least in terms of you know psychoanalytic therapy. Um, but you know we we still in the domain of psychoanalysis. Uh, tend to define psychopathology as essentially something individual in nature. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering if maybe we can talk a little bit about that. What, what, what are the errors that, that you see in, in the whole paradigm of, of psychoanalysis? And, you know, we, you know, as, as James Hillman says, we've had a hundred years of psychotherapy and the world is getting worse. <laughs> right. Yeah. And uh, the Freudian project is uh, they they ignore that these days. I mean, these, yeah, these, these private uh, models that try to avoid the picture. I mean, that's, to me, that's one, one text that's very fundamental to me is Freud's civilization and its discontents. I mean, there it is, extremely radical text, you know, that's, 
we're we're we can't really handle being domesticated and yet we are domesticated i mean he really says that's the basis for neurosis that's the machine for creating unhappiness i mean that's really amazing that's but of course you know he at, in, at the end of the day he came down on the side of repression well you can't chuck civilization can you well of course you can't i mean at least you can at least see that <laughs> uh, but he was you know very bourgeois standard guy he wasn't gonna uh he wasn't gonna really consider that even though in in one text he gave the most far-reaching reason for uh the unhappiness that reigns so much i mean there it is so if that's the that's the cause of it duh you remove it you yeah. remove the cause of it but no no can't can't go that far <laughs> and some of it is you know some of it's uh i mean it, what it, we didn't have just to back up for a second we we didn't have the anthropology that we have now now there's been more uh a greater uh, opening to to what the real record is what the real evidence is you know because i think of uh another text that's been very important to me dialectic of enlightenment by adorno and horkheimer you know i i tend to think of that one because you know they're, they're talking about the odyssey i think it's book 12 where the famous rather famous part where odysseus is sailing past the sirens and he <laughs> He has he has the crew has their ears stuffed up with wax and he has himself lashed to the mast so that they can get past the temptation arrows freedom come on <laughs> land and we'll have a party we'll have you know we'll have everything that you're losing you're you're sailing to regression or repression that's that's the destination mm -hmm. it's it's all there it's just an amazing little uh slice of it but you know at the end of the discussion of that they said uh well yeah that's it makes it pretty clear the nature of civilization in repression you know yeah they go to these extreme lengths to avoid pleasure and freedom and work you know all that stuff that the sirens obviously represent but then they it that the essay concludes by saying well but after all if you don't dominate nature if you don't have domestication and civilization you won't have society mm -hmm. so therefore it's a bad bargain but it's necessary well that's not true they didn't have any grasp of the record of, of you know what we of what we know in the past you know half a century or so in terms of in terms of the anthropological picture but right but that's their caveat at the end just like freud he's not going to say yeah check the whole thing it's a horrible voyage to sadness in, in all of the problems of the modern world. But, but both of those things are very worth considering. You just leave out the improbable or <laughs> irrational ending. You know, the, they, they, had a, they, they show you the thing and then they say, well, no, but we can't go that far. Well, what else can you do? You, you, otherwise you swallow the pill, you, you end up chained to the mass, the, the work machine, the, the sadness of uh, present society and future society will be that much worse day by day. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, and- uh, I, don't have any, I don't have any particular uh, stuff about uh, psychoanalysis though. I mean, that's just general cultural uh, right. concept. Or, you know right well yeah i mean you know you, you talk you talk about uh the psychological society um and how the psychological society conditions its subject into blaming themselves right and and you say that those who most feel they need therapy tend to be those who are most easily exploited the loneliest the most insecure and nervous the most depressed and um i think that's a very very good point uh where you know, we, we, we have this, this situation now where because people can't conform uh, to the structure of, of the dominating culture, of the, of the techno monoculture, uh, they are made to feel like somehow they're inadequate. 
somehow they're to blame. Somehow there's something wrong with them. And that's how naturalized this, this technoculture has become. You know, the, the technopathocracy, the rule of sick machines is, is here to stay and it's just become seemingly for, for, for most people, the reality that we're immersed in. And, you know, uh, you can't, if you can't live with it, then there must be something wrong with you. Right. Right. You're punished for even, uh, considering it and in various ways, you know, it's just, uh, some people have made it, you know, even more explicit. I remember the conversation with Donna Haraway mm -hmm. and she said, well, you're, you're playing the role of some angry prophet who wants to be outside of this thing, but you can't be, you'll get nowhere. You're just this uh, ridiculous figure. You've got to play the game. You've got to be part of it. And I just, I was just speechless. I mean, what a complete cave in, but it was honest that there it is in all of its naked surrender and, and uh, failure of ethics or thinking. I was just amazed. And in fact, I was interviewing her. I didn't even bring anything up. I wasn't, I wasn't attacking her. Uh -huh. We were, I was just, you know, we were taping this interview. She was here for some conference and then she jumps out and it struck me later, you must have a pretty guilty conscience. I mean, you're attacking me. Did I, what did I say? Did I, was I telling you you're a phony sellout piece of shit? <laughs> I, I more or less came to that conclusion. I'll tell you, but I, I wasn't, I wasn't insulting her or being abusive. Right. Anyway, right. People yep. like that are there on the forefront, the cutting edge of, of making everything worse. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, when, when, when I'm having these kinds of discussions with people, you know, and they ask, well, what can we do? What can we do but accept this, this dominating totality? I mean, one, one answer that I give is to say, look to the, li the living images that are presented by the natural world. You know, as as human beings have done since 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 the beginning of our existence on this planet, and that let those living images of the natural world be be the guide, and not 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 fantasy images, right? And we're living now in a domain of images that that stem from the collective repressed fantasy life. You know, that's what the whole internet is essentially, is images right. stemming from the collective repressed fantasy life. That's not an image to live by. Yeah, but and you know, people are not very, <clears throat> they're not very thrilled with it. They're not very happy. People are, you know, for example, are glued to their iPhones. You know, there's been lots of information saying that they're bored. They're, they're not in love with it. They seem to be addicted, but at least they're not, you know, I'll kill you if you take away my cell phone or something. No, they're not. There's no particular allegiance, but that's all there is mm -hmm. as they're presented. Anyway, it's, it's obviously not all there is, but well, it's, it's all there is in terms of the dominant uh, reign of things. You know, you don't get a Ted talk to, to rip all this to shreds, which is rather easy to do. You just won't be invited. You know? <laughs> I'm not waiting for my invitation to, to do that, but <laughs> but you know we do have some opportunities to to talk to people or c converse with people. Yeah, ab ab absolutely, uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, and what else? What else to say here? You know, I I think uh, you know I want to bring up this this beautiful uh, quote by Stan Brakhage. I don't know if you know Stan Brakhage. Oh, the filmmaker. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but you know he he says. Um, Imagine an eye unruled by man-made laws of perspective, an eye unprejudiced by compositional logic, an eye which does not respond to the name of everything, but which must know each object encountered in life through an adventure of perception. How many colors are there in the fields of grass to the crawling baby unaware of, quote, green? How many rainbows can light create for the untutored eye? How aware of variations in heat waves can that eye be? Imagine a world alive with incomprehensible objects and shimmering with an endless variety of movement and innumerable gradations of color. Imagine a world before the beginning was the word. And, you know, I think that, that this, this quote really shows us uh, the, the, the potential for a radical revolution in terms of, of our sensory engagement with the world, right? Which starts, which starts from, from we re, re, sorry, reawakening the heart, the, the feeling center, 
And once that is reawakened and people stop living in the state of near permanent dissociation, then this, this opening up of, of the senses and the embrace of the living, living images of the natural worlds can, can start to manifest in a profound way and bring about the kind of radical transformation that, that I think we're both, we're both looking for. Oh, excellent. That, that's, a, that's a great quote and that's a, a wonderful insights from you. That's, that's really, that is the heart of it, literally and figuratively. That's, uh, and that's what we're counting on. Uh, you know, that, that hasn't died. Everything fights against it, almost everything, but uh, it's still there. Otherwise, there wouldn't be so much pain. Yeah. You know, we'd just be zombies and we'd be happy enough, you know, and nobody would uh, turn to these destructive things or mindless things. You know, you wouldn't need that much distraction and diversion if people were actually, you know, basically okay with it. They're not on a visceral level, on a real level. Right. Never mind the tons of propaganda, the crazy desperate effect, the desperate attempts, it seems to me, to... Uh, you know, to justify it. And they do get more and more desperate. Like I'm thinking of Daniel Pinker, mm -hmm. uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature, or whatever that book. That's just crazed. That, that's just bizarre. They, now, they, now they're on, uh, on call to defend civilization. And, you know, gee, uh, what makes you so uptight about it? You need to put out this, this crazy... Uh, version of reality it, it was just shredded by critics n none of which probably were primitivists but you know insane oh there's less and less violence people are more and more happy i mean just a crazy view of things what planet are you on yeah, but, the, but yeah. the, the need to do that the need to come out and try to combat all this all the lurking feelings the the fears the uh the doubts about all this the this it's not having a pleasant sleep, you know, the, it's just all, uh, well, I wouldn't say it's crumbling yet, but it's getting there, you know, where people are just, uh, you want it even worse than this. You want, this is, this is horrible. And, you know, welcome aboard, keep on voting, keep on imagining that the stakes are, are that contrived and, and reduced that you've got nowhere to go. Well, you got everywhere to go. You know, you see that, and that's that's uh, open. It's available. Yeah. yeah, and maybe we can talk a little bit about you know the the material in, in your book, A People's History of Civilization, because there you bring up many, many, many attempts uh, that that um, where, where people have resisted the civilizing impulse. You know, and I think that a lot of these efforts that you discuss in that great book have just been completely forgotten. I mean, the Luddites, for example, now when you use the word Luddite, people laugh at you because the meaning of it is just has been lost. You know, that they, they think that the Luddites were just some kind of naive people who, you know, uh, had these, these fantasy notions. But no, they, they saw the, the wide, wide scale de-skilling of the population. They saw the autonomy t being taken away from, from workers. Uh, and they saw people being forced into the factory system and their lives being ruined as a result of these impositions. Yeah, so, exactly. So, and the huge support they had throughout England, it was that's overlooked as well. Mm -hmm. Everybody could see it coming. the The industrialization of things was uh, that was the decade. Well, the first two decades of the nineteenth century, it was pretty clear what was going on. And some people, like the handloom weavers, uh, starved rather than be subject to that to the the slavery of the textile factories, they held out because they wanted that autonomy and those skills and that community, and they could see it being uh, ground under. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know this was and this was uh, part and parcel of of the imposition of of clock time as well, which is oh. another thing now that that people just take for granted that we live our lives by the clock. But but. Yeah. You know, as you show in your work, this this has a very specific, uh, very specific origin that has been all but forgotten. People don't stop to think what 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 existence, human existence, was like before we were forced to live with clocks. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, time is a material thing. That's a, it's a very, uh, well, it's a bizarre development, but it's so basic, such a basic symbolic dimension. But yeah, we don't question it. We look at our watch and everything is timed. And of course, it speeds up. It's always speeding up. If you're on the computer and it takes a, a full second to get something, people are conditioned to be very unhappy with that. And when you think about it, oh, you have to wait one second for that? And that's <laughs> that's a terrific imposition. Or, I mean, it just shows, you know, we're just being trained with the machine going faster and faster all the time. Yeah, and, and it goes back to this this discussion about the the dominant medical paradigm suppressing disease because people don't want to well it's not that people don't want to it's that many people just aren't able to afford the time to heal you know they, they can't they can't take a year off work to get better it's not possible uh and so there's this you know uh rather than than actually engage in a deep healing process that takes place over a long period of time and is a slow process of gradually regaining vitality, disease is suppressed because we've got to keep up with schedule. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's such a reality, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. And the same with thinking, same way with thinking through these things. You know, not everybody has the time and energy to do that. Um, you know, it's just, that's, uh, that's part of the imposition Fast food, it's all, I mean, all these different unhealthy things. You don't have the time to cook or you don't have the time to, for this or that. And you, you're you racing through life. And in the poor, they want time to go faster to get to the end of the month while they still have some money left. I mean, think of that. that that's, that's a, you know, that's pretty basic stuff, but it's no joke. I mean, that they want it to go faster because they only have so much in the way of resources. Right. Well, there's a, you know, myriad ways of, you know, illustrating this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so maybe we can talk a little bit about what it would actually look like for a kind of contemporary Luddite, Luddite position, you know? Uh, and I mean, you know, so when, when, as soon as you start talking about things that, that people hold really dear, like a car, you know, it's like, oh, well, how can I live without a car? You know, because the whole road, the whole the whole world has been paved over with roads, right? You know, but uh, so what 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 would you say to someone like who brings up the object objection? Well, I can't survive without a car. What am I going to do? Well, it's been structured that way. It's been engineered that way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You you don't you don't have a free a palette of choices. You know that's. People are stuck in these things. It's going to take a while to work ourselves out of it to go in a better direction. I mean, it's. I think it can be very inspiring and liberating to start to imagine uh, a different place where we where we had a closeness to the earth and a closeness with each other. Everybody wants that. Mm -hmm. uh, you you wouldn't find anyone who would say no. I don't want that. Well, I, I guess you would, but you know, there it is and. Then, as you referred to earlier, you can see what stands in the way of that, you know, step by step historically. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of conversation right now in terms of the pandemic from some of these urban uh, outlets, you know, well, we know it's all about density. It's been about density since domestication. Right. These things don't uh, don't get going unless you have enough people. Or, and or animals packed together, relatively packed together. Yeah. So, so we need a radically decentralized world. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in which we had forever. And yeah. So, you know, they, and some of these outfits I've been reading just in the past few weeks, they're turning themselves inside out, trying to uh, validate or rescue cities. Well, okay, uh, density is the problem, but, you know, as if it just occurred to them, you can't have cities without density. So, so they're saying, oh, but we can adjust it. We can reframe it or we can, oh, really? Well, how? tell me how. You know, you, you're not even looking at what the reason for cities is, what constitutes a city, what is, what is the fundamental dependency of a city 
you know, all, all of it, trade, that, that leads to war. You've got to guarantee the input uh, to cities for all these things. I mean, you know, it all unravels. And there is the answer. Well, all of these things. Yeah. But of course, these are the people that, you know, they're, they're urbanists. They, they worship the city. And uh, now there's, you know, some people leaving the city for the obvious reason of the pandemic, uh, for that reason alone. So they have to do this rescue effort to, uh, you know, to justify the ideology of cities. Well, not, well, the ideology of the reality of it, mm -hmm. you know, start to see what constitutes urban life and what has been the result of it. Right. And, you know, th th this, this overgrowth of resources um, and the consequent weakening and disruption of the ecosystem uh, is the result of, of the, the pandemic that we're experiencing now, you know, and, and will be grounds for other more virulent pandemics that we're going to experience in the future. You know, overgrowth of resources just is, is going to, it, it perpetuates this logic, you know, of uh, progress as domination. And, right. and, and that leads to regression, the worst kind of regression. Yeah, it's it's all of a piece. These things all all work together. There's a line from Adorno. I'm just paraphrasing, but he says it's it's a vain effort to look at at the cause of this or that in society when you get to this level of integration of the whole. Society is the reason, not this or that. You you're not seeing the into the bigger picture, of course, if you you have to come to grips with that. And which calls to mind another another quote I love, Mustafa Kayati, who was a 60s uh, uh, radical uh, Arab character. He said, the university teaches us everything about society except what it is. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> Fantastic. Such a brief line, it just it says everything. <laughs> Well, no, we don't think about what it is. You know, we don't think about the very, you know, I mean, that's just, it's wonderful. It speaks for itself. Yeah. Uh, well, um, I think we covered a lot. Is, is there anything else that you want to you want to discuss? Any, oh, any well, final words? We could talk all day. I really enjoyed this, Victor. Well, me too. Glad we could talk, man. Well, I hope we can stay in touch. I, oh, I want to. I'd love to. See what you've been doing, what your, you know, your specific current projects and, you know, that sort of thing. I'm very curious. Well, yeah, I'd, I'd love to stay in touch. We'll keep the discussion going. Beautiful. And, uh, yeah, I'll provide a link to your website if people want to know more about your work and where they can find your books. And are you working on any, any writing projects currently? Yeah, just now I'm working on a book where I hope for the spring catalog from Feral House. It's a collection of stuff, and uh, I think it's going to be called When We Are Human. Uh -huh. And there's there's a fair amount of the basic health stuff there, you know, that's the foundation or lack of it, you know, that's to the point. It's it's various stuff, history stuff, some philosophy, some technology stuff, but that's, you know, my books are that way. It's just kind of a bunch of stuff, and hopefully together they shed some light on things. So, mm -hmm. yeah, thanks for asking. Excellent. Well, thanks again. Thank and you, Peter. Enjoy Keep the rest of your day. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.